Sports Talk Chicago. Here with John Zaglul, and we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's the host of Mully and Haw on 670 The Score and a contributor to NBC Sports Chicago. Please welcome David Haw to the program. David, it's great to have you on. How are you? Thanks for having me back. You're doing well. Busy uh, week. It's great to have games to talk about. It's great to have baseball back. And you got four teams in action in Chicago, so every night seems like a new storyline. David, what's wrong with the Cubs back? Well, that's a great question, and we don't have long enough. I think we could we could have a, a spring uh, seminar and still uh, only scratch <laughs> the surface in terms of research. It, it really goes back to, you know, a couple seasons ago and, you know, the, the way that um, pitchers are approaching the Cubs and, and I think the way the league is pitching uh, hitters, it, it's all very much related, but the bottom line is the Cubs have too many – true outcome players, either the strikeout walk or home run, and they need more contact guys. They need to move guys, get them on, get them over and get them in. And, and I just think that it's, it, they're caught in between trying to be that selective hitter and trying to be in David Ross's words, you know, be selfish and, and be aggressive more so than they have been. And, and um, the result is the a league worst batting average as we sit here today talking going into their uh, game against the uh, go, going against their, their game with the Brewers, they're hitting 167. That's not going to win many divisions. So they just have a chronic issue related to their approach and then their ability. Are you at all surprised by this? Yes, I, I am very surprised. Uh, it, it's something that you didn't expect to have happen again. Maybe I shouldn't be. I think that we're structured as sports fans and, media to think that guys going into contracts years as that's going to be a good thing because they have that motivation and that incentive to produce. But I think what's happened is at least, okay, listen, we're only 11, 12 games into the season. So uh, we don't want to overreact, even though there's, you know, there's an industry based on overreaction that is sports talk radio. But if we don't overreact, we understand there's a lot of baseball left. I'm surprised though, that, the guys who have the most to gain from having a good year, two or three of them on the Cubs, Javi Baez, Anthony Rizzo, aren't off to great starts. Chris Bryant is, is off to a better start. But I just wonder if the specter of the final season, the, the, the contract year, is going to have the desired effects for the Cubs in that you, know, you, you expect players to rise to the occasion and you don't know if they're going to do that or if the pressure that's inherent – and the contractual reality is going to be, in fact, a deterrent to have them have some success. What should the Cubs do then moving forward? Is it time to sell, or is that too early yet? Way too early, way too early. Boy, how old are you? You're already cynical. You're already (laughs) jaded. You're already (laughs) trading everybody, backing up the van. Um, Look, I I understand the question because that's sort of the way we're wired, but I do believe it's too early. I I think you've got to, you've got to, you know, ask yourself, if if um, the date the date uh, that you would consider such a thing or such a movement or direction is earlier or creeping up on you if things continue to go south, but I don't think we're there yet, John. I think that you know when you look at it as we sit here in the Cubs are getting ready to play the Brewers, they're lucky to be to start five and six as bad as they have hit. So you could you could rationalize it if you're Jed Hoy or if you're um, in that front office and say. Well, you know what? Let's let's give some more time. Let's get them going because we are treading water and we haven't hit a lick. So I think they're probably more likely to look at it that way than overreact and panic and start uh, taking phone calls about trades. Do you think the pitching will hold up? I mean, it's been a great start, both the bullpen and the rotation. Do you think that sustains all year? I think that uh, the, the starting rotation has an opportunity to be better than we thought it would be. I think that it's one of those things where you know, there wasn't a real blockbuster off season. They were more like they, they assembled and, uh, and re- rebuilt their starting rotation with serviceable guys, solid more than spectacular. And you, you respect the way that they started out the first spin through the rotation. You know, it, it's going to be, the Cubs are going to be kind of what they started out as. I think it's, I, I thought they would be uh, slightly above 500. You know, that is sort of the definition of mediocrity. So you're going to have good, spins through the rotation you're gonna have not so good spins through the rotation i think the pitching will hold up well enough to the point where it might be a strength of this team the starting rotation um 
and and that's basically because they have some veterans who can do the job, but also because their offense might end up being the weakness. David Haw here on Sports Talk Chicago. David, did you expect the bullpen issues for the White Sox? I hope that they are temporary. I hope that they are just a product of, uh, of you know, uh, baseball, you know, getting off the slow start and these kinds of things that you see and, and the adjustment period for Liam Hendricks and, and some of the other guys not being what, um, you know, you would want ideally. Uh, they have too much talent to be expected to be this inconsistent for too long. I, I do think that they will snap out of this eventually, and the Sox will eventually – get on the kind of role that we expect them to get on. They've had some injuries. Um, they've had some injuries that you can't overlook either. So not to make excuses for them. Um, if they are not better, let's put it this way, if the bullpen doesn't improve, that becomes a storyline and the story of the Chicago baseball season because we were told by members of that bullpen that they were going to be the best in baseball this year. So far, they haven't been. What about the left field situation? Who should be starting there for the Sox right now? Well, I, I'm a believer that, you know, you have some flexibility that, you know, Andrew Vaughn offers. And if he's going to be good enough to um, keep on your major league rosters because he can hit, you don't want to supplant, you know, your mean Mercedes from the designated hitter role. Andrew Vaughn is a guy that has, you know, had kind of an up and down a uh, couple of weeks playing the position. He's new to it, but he's a good athlete. Hey, if Tony La Russa calls him a plus defender above average in left field, then I, I think that um, I don't know if he's trying to oversell it or not, but let's give the kid a chance and, and see what he has. I, that's where I would be going if I were the White Sox. That would be my, my uh, default uh, lineup with Andrew Vaughn in left field until Adam Engel returns. Then once Adam Engel returns, then I'd have to get a little more creative and I'd have some more options. Um, Mercedes start changes a little bit in terms of how you use Vaughn, but I do like the idea of him right now until Engel gets back to being my left fielder. Do you think tactically La has done a good job so far? What's your evaluation? Mixed results. Mixed results. I think definitely mixed results because um, I have found some of the moves curious. And we had him on the score over the weekend, and I think I asked him a question about the speed of the game and adjusting and adapting as a manager who's been out of – the game for 10, 10 years. And, and I, I asked him a question in, in a respectful way, John, I wasn't trying to, you know, do anything, <laughs> but that, and, and, I, and I mean it too. I mean, I think that w when you get away from anything for 10 years, no matter how accomplished you are, I think there's going to be an adjustment period that, you know, we have seen uh, unfold in real time. And, and so that's, um, that's, that's not, that that's not anything to diminish. And I think we've seen that a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, but I, I do want to keep an open mind and, and give him the respect that he's earned. And and have I liked the decisions that he's made? Not all of them. I mean, there's been enough to there's been enough scrutiny to keep White Sox Twitter ablaze. But um, <laughs> I, I also think that you want to be careful with the social media reaction. That that's not always you know gospel either. Somewhere in between is the truth. And the truth is, I think Tony Larusa is still going to need some more time to adjust and adapt. Um, as he gets to know this team as well, because he's been out for a long time. But, uh, you know, he, he has made some curious moves in the bullpen. I have had more issue probably with his lineups because I find them kind of odd. Nick Williams batting fifth in any day is, I think, a bad call. But, um, you know, it's early, and we'll, let's, let's see how this unfolds. Did you like the hiring from the beginning? Were you a proponent of it? Well, um, okay, let me let me say this, you know, I wasn't a big proponent of it at the time. I didn't understand the process as much as anything. I felt like Jerry Reinsdorf had hijacked the price process and I was um, reluctant to endorse something that rewarded somebody with his uh, DUI history. Once we found out exactly what that was and, you know, that he had had another incident that was unclear to the extent that the Sox knew about it. So, I guess my concerns were primarily with the process and Jerry Reinsdorf essentially, you know, in my opinion, kind of making sure that Sox hired somebody with it in his right as the owner. But I don't know that the Rick Hahn would have hired Tony La Russa if he were left to his own devices. So I felt like the process was a little bit um, worth questioning and deserved some scrutiny. And I felt like once they found out about the, 
the DUI arrest in Arizona, I, I wondered if that was really, is, is that the really the message you want to send as an organization? Now, that said, his baseball credentials speak for themselves, and I'm willing to keep an open mind about, you know, being out of the, the dugout for a decade because I think that he can, he can adapt. And he's, you know, he's, he, it seems even like, you know, I tried to say he's, he's, he's a bright baseball guy, but he remains a bright baseball guy. He's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. So I think you want to be respectful and, uh, and he deserves that. And so my mind is, remains open. I think he's got some work to do. Um, this team may require a little more managing and rather than the, you thought it would be on autopilot. But uh, the, the concerns I had early on were not necessarily rooted primarily in the baseball uh, baseball ability or the managing ability of Tony La Russa, more so in the process and some of the parameters that, uh, under which he was hired. How far do they go realistically, based on what you've seen so far and what's to come? Well, I think I think they can still – I think all the everything's still in play. I mean, every every uh, every goal that they have established um, and that they proclaimed loudly in spring training is still attainable. You know, we're we're 11, 12 games in. There's nothing the Sox can't do. Uh, so I I think that uh, it just may be uh, you know baseball seasons unfold in ways that we can never predict or imagine, and the Sox may have a more securitous path to the playoffs or to the division title and maybe even to the world series. But um, that's part of the, the beauty of the sport and following it. But I, I don't think I've seen anything that would make me think the Sox still are not fully capable of accomplishing everything that they want. David Haw here with me on sports talk, Chicago, David, let's talk bears. Now, what was your reaction to the Andy Dalton signing? Well, I think they made the best of a bad situation. I, I, I don't know that, um, I was ever a big believer that, you know, Russell Wilson made any sense realistically. Uh, I tend to be a, a realist in, in from a realistic standpoint. Um, Andy Dalton gives them an opportunity to uh, maintain the middle ground and or, or you know, maybe put a better way and more truer way. They ascend to the middle ground. They had times where they were really bad offensively last year. They got to the point where against bad defenses, they looked better. Uh, I know you were a Mitch guy, but I don't think that you always <laughs> um, looked at how his limitations made their ceiling lower than it than it needed to be. So what I think that I think that Andy Dalton's signing, what it does is it raises the floor. It may not it may not raise the ceiling much higher or as high as you would like to ideally, but I think it raises the floor. And your level of competence is going to be more predictable. And when you are as bad as the Bears were at times um, offensively, they were inconsistent for a lot of different reasons. That's not the debate here. But you want to have things that you can predict and project on a weekly basis. And Andy Dalton, to me, gives them a better chance to do that than the other quarterbacks that they could have gotten probably, um, at least realistically. Let me ask you this, though. Are the Bears officially done a quarterback when it comes to the draft? Oh, I think they could draft a quarterback in the second round and be very happy about it. I think they could draft a quarterback in the first round and be thrilled about it. I, I would not like to see them move up in the draft to do that. But there's nothing that says to me that Andy Dalton's presence precludes them from drafting a quarterback and developing that guy. You need to, do, you need to be operating on different, um, different platforms. and You need a starter. You need a developmental guy. You need a solid backup. You know, the, the Bears have two or three. They, they have never really had a quarterback that has truly been developed right. You know, Mitch Trubisky had a four-game apprenticeship, and he didn't learn from anybody. And, he, you know, that would be fine if he had the college experience, like, say, a Kellen Mond does from Texas A&M. Mitch Trubisky came in as a newbie, and he was never given the chance to really develop or grow under anybody but, you know, Mike Lennon. And that doesn't count. That's like, you know, that's like enrolling – in in college and, and thinking you're going to get the you know really a quality education from a, a professor with tenure and you show up in a TA's there for your first <laughs> you know semester it, it just isn't fair to the to the uh, pupil to to have a mentor that's not qualified and Mitch never had that so that's not making excuses for him but he started off on the wrong foot and he never really got the the solid footing so I think that you need to develop a quarterback and if they draft one 
in a couple of weeks, I would be put it this way, John, if they don't draft one, I think it's professional negligence. Really? So you prefer a quarterback at that spot compared to a wide receiver or offensive lineman? Well, I think you got to be. I think you got to be creative and and you you um, and also practical. So you have two picks in the first uh, fifty-two selections. If you don't trade back, if you don't if you don't uh, change at all, and I think that yeah, I, I would I would be in favor. I, I don't want to go so far and maybe be as strong as say if you don't get a quarterback in those spots, it is professional negligence, um, because I think that there might be other needs and other players that drop to you. But I think that if you have an opportunity to draft a quarterback that is high enough on your board that you could project to be a starter and you don't because you are, you prioritize another position like wide receiver, which I, I think would not be something I would do, um, I think that would be uh, borderline negligent. So, you know, my needs, if I'm the Bears cornerback, offensive tackle quarterback, and, and maybe in that order or maybe cornerback quarterback if your first two picks – uh, that'd be probably the way I would go in thinking. Are you bracing for a Ryan Pace mistake? Um, I, I, with Ryan Pace, you know, I, I'm, I have low expectations in terms <laughs> of the draft, and and I and I just don't know if this off season, which has been underwhelming at best, has positioned him or the Bears for the to achieve long-term success. I, I don't know where exactly where they're going, John. And, and I think that, you know, their off season moves have been, um, did, have, have been not ambitious. Uh, their, their draft likely will, if they follow, follow suit, be just as, you know, so, <laughs> ordinary. And, you know, after the season they had, ordinary is not going to cut it. So I guess my expectations for Ryan Pace are that if he's going in, to this season believing that he has to make the playoffs or lose his job i would make sure that i have a uh i, I would put it this way i i would make sure that i'm braced for um moving on because i i just don't know that um he's i just don't know if he's in a, put the, the bears in a position to to project long-term success and if that's the case what's matt Nagy's status then moving forward well, I, I think that they're probably aligned. You know, I think that they probably are aligned. And I'm not so worried about the contract length of the respective uh, deals. I think that's irrelevant when you talk about a three and a half billion dollar, you know, corporation. It's, you're talking about one year difference or so. So uh, I think Matt Nagy's facing the same sort of, you know, employment reality, if you want to call it that. So uh, I think they both need to win. I think that probably Pace has done. Um, has more strikes against him uh, professionally in Chicago than, than Matt Nagy. And that, that's not to say that Matt Nagy couldn't reinvent himself and, and survive and pers- per- persevere and, and, you know, even succeed under a different general manager. But my sense is that if the Bears don't have success in 2021 and they end up cleaning house, I don't think they're going to, they're going to keep one or the other. I think they're looking at them both as a package deal. 